So uh, thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming in, and for those of you tuning in online, how you doing? Uh, today we're talking about roses. Um, as some of you know, last year we had the biggest run on roses that we could remember in a while. Uh, we just sold out of everything very early in the season. So apparently roses are uh, in again. So this is this is great. Uh, we were able to. We were really worried that we wouldn't be able to get enough roses in for this year because of this. Uh, but we were able to uh, to find what we needed. So we've got one truck after another coming in with roses. So you guys are going to have plenty <coughs> to choose from. So I basically just went down to the rose section and grabbed whatever was blooming today. Uh, a lot of them are in bud, but not quite burst open. But this is right at that time when when they're opening. Uh, I've done this class in the past in like March or you know real early in the year and they're not quite open yet so generally we're talking uh, I guess what you call book knowledge without actually showing very much because we didn't have everything in bloom yet but uh, uh, right now this is perfect everything's in bloom um, this is when we've got a lot of roses coming in they're available they're ready to plant it's warmed up so you don't have to worry about any is damage happening to roses that are, are pruned down or too small to really be well insulated against the cold. So this is a fantastic time to be putting in your roses right now. Um, for those of you who already have roses, you, uh, I hope you pruned them uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it's now warm enough to do that. You can go ahead. If you haven't done it, go ahead and do it right now. Um, in fact, um, I'm not sure, but if we have time, we're going to do a pruning uh, de demonstration um, <laughs> after the class. We kind of left some roses unpruned out uh, in the landscape around the parking lot. So uh, if possible, uh, we're going to have, uh, uh, we'll kind of prune them down in front of you in, in case anyone wants to just, just watch and see, okay, what kind of reasoning do we use when we go and prune those? Uh, so for right now, we'll start with the, the speaking and question, uh, questions and answers part. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, I respond really well conversating with everybody, so please ask questions. Uh, so as you can see, I've got a kind of a menagerie up here uh, of all different sizes and types. You know, it used to be, uh, when you thought of roses, you generally thought of like a traditional uh, kind of hybrid tea type. Let's see which one is this. This is Alfred Alfred Sisley, and so this one uh, is typically what we think of when we, we when we think of, of a rose. Uh, basically, you have got the rootstock, the graft, and then these canes, which get very large and thick, coming out, and those canes are what kind of support the whole bush. And generally, the old rule was. You would prune down that bush until there were only about three or five at the most canes. And the reason for that was to make the flowers larger. Fewer canes <coughs> forces the bush to put more energy into making the flowers bigger. So if you liked lots of flowers on your bush, you really wanted to have plenty of them, you went with five. If you really wanted to maximize the size, you went with three. And so you would, at the end of every winter, room until you had only about three really healthy young canes and then more stems and canes would grow out of those and create the bush for the entire season. Um, what I have found is that these tend to have, uh, these are still very popular because of the fragrance, but some people kind of want an easier rose and so that's why a, a lot of what you're going to see in stock now is going to be something more something more like this guy. And you see how he's bushier. And he's gonna stay like this as he grows. He's gonna get bigger. He's gonna do, when he's fully grown, this is gonna be about four foot approximately. This is called a shrub rose. And it's basically gonna stay like this. I would still say you wanna prune every year, um, but there's less of a, a how should I put it? Uh, you, everybody kind of, worries about am I cutting out the right canes, am I doing it the right length, am I, oh it, it, it just stresses me out and I'm, a, I'm afraid to even plant a rose because I'm afraid I'm going to prune it wrong. I get that so much 
With the shrub roses, you kind of leave them bushy. You don't have to be so finicky about the way you prune these. And really the shrub rose is uh, something that is intended for the landscape. This is meant to be in the landscape looking beautiful. Uh, so, I mean, it's gonna have roses that are good for cutting um, and putting in a vase, but really its main purpose is to be beautiful in the garden. And so this is going to be more of a bushy look. You'll, you won't see those thick canes at the bottom uh, as much as you used to. It's gonna be more down on the ground, not quite so big, nice, reasonable size, bushy. You don't really see the canes anymore. So these, uh, we've just gotten so much demand for. Everybody's really loving this low maintenance bush. I would say every year, take out your, your great big, thick woody canes, take those out because they don't produce as well anymore. Take those out, take anything that doesn't look so so great, kind of shape up the bush and you're calling it good. You're just not going to put as much thinking into it. You can, you absolutely can, but you don't have to. Generally these don't have a graft, sometimes they do, but mostly you'll just see a lot of canes coming up out of the, uh, the ground. So you're not even worrying about where the graft is and what you're doing with it. So this one, if you're wondering which ones are the shrub roses, because there's so many different types up here, if you're wondering which ones are the shrub roses, uh, most of them that we got in this year are in this pot that says Easy Elegance, because that's exactly what it is. They're easy. They're meant to be easy. So it doesn't have to be so technical anymore. So you can just enjoy the rose. The nice thing about shrub roses is that they bloom like crazy. They're going to have so many flowers on them. This right here, this one that is... Uh, blooming so much this right here is a shrub rose Question. yes do they have a fragrance do they have what a fragrance uh, do they have a fragrance um, some of them do um, they don't always have as much as a hybrid tea but uh, let's see this one is the grace and grit so that one not, not not so much but some of them do yeah do they go go good in pots they look fabulous in pots. You can put any rose, and I do mean any rose, in a pot. In fact, I have several at home in my container garden. You can put rose in, roses in pots. I get that question a lot. The shrub roses look great in pots. They really do because they're so bushy. They look fantastic when you put them in a pot. You just have this big mound of flowers come mushrooming out of the pot. It looks beautiful. So these are really great for pots. This one's called Grace and Grit. Tough, but beautiful. So, um, this one is a similar right here. This is basically, this is called a, uh, oh sorry, this is a shrub rose. Again, lots and lots of flowers. The one I was looking for, this one. Uh, this one is called a carpet rose or ground cover rose. I wouldn't call it a real wide ground cover, but it, it, uh, they call it that because it stays low to the ground. It's basically just like a shrub rose, only shorter. One and a half to two foot tall. This one is small enough, you can actually put this in your flower bed. You know, maybe you've got a, a bed of perennials, uh, you know, you, your, your daisies and your sages and your coreopsis and your rubecchias. You, know, you have that flower bed, maybe it's even a border bed. This is small enough you can actually put this in and just mix it in with other flowers. A lot of times we have a, a way of thinking with roses. I'm not sure what started this. Uh, we think of roses as something that have to be set apart. It has to be a rose garden. You can't put any other flowers in with the roses. I don't know where that started. I have no idea. Actually, roses look great with other plants. If you've got big roses, you put them in with lavenders and Russian sage and let them play off of each other. They look fantastic. Make a giant living bouquet. Uh, find flowers that really set those roses off and just mix them together. Uh, for small roses like this, like I said, they, they mix in well with the perennial bed. And this one is a single. This is what we call a single, where you have one layer of petals. Some people really like that simpler look, rather than that classic, uh, it's all, all been done before look. They like that kind of more simple, modern look. Uh, so if you, if you like that, this is a single rose. But the carpets do come in. 
doubles as well. Let's see, is this a carpet? Yes. Oh, this is Pink Supreme. Now this one's not blooming yet. It's covered in buds though. I know it's hard to see uh, for you guys back there, but it's covered in buds. Again, you see how it's nice and bushy, pretty easy to care for. Um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're afraid of pruning, again, great, great bushy look. You just kind of cut the thing back every year a little bit. Not all the way, but pretty far. Just let it grow back out. This one's called Pink Supreme, and it is a supreme color, a supreme shade of pink. It's like hot pink, just flaming. I have this at home, and I have another one real similar called Pink Splash, which is the, the, the hot pink splashed with white. They're just fantastic, and you, you zero in on them. Literally this morning, as I was gathering these together, uh, one of our planters was getting ready for the day, and as he was walking by, he did this. I thought it was going to run into a pole. <laughs> so these are these are uh, uh, just easy, easy roses. We wanted, like I said, the, the biggest thing that I hear from people is I want, I love roses, but I just don't want to put that much work into them. I want it to be easy. So we're really kind of moving over to that uh, shrub and, and ground cover rose. So uh, this one again is a, is a shrub. This one is a real pretty. Uh, Kind of lavender pink. Again, covered in buds. Here's a picture. Just a beautiful rose. This is going to be fantastic. Uh, head over heels. I can't wait for this one to bloom. This is going to be gorgeous. Going to be gorgeous. So now this again is a cane rose. This is a Thorbunda. Kind of similar to the shrub, but more. That's kind of somewhere in between a hybrid tea and a shrub, really. So basically, you know, another question that I, uh, did you have a question? Okay. An another question that uh, I get about roses is how do we keep those uh, insects off? Because <laughs> those are an issue. And this year, this year, thrip have hit harder than ever. I've never seen it this bad. I'm seeing thrip on plants that never get thrip. So and all day long, customers have been coming in saying, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? And they've all got that curly, twisted, cupped leaf and flowers drying up. Uh, big flowers will have a singed petal. The edges will actually look singed. And the, um, the smaller flowers, and I'm not just talking roses, I'm talking everything. Some real small flowers are just drying up. And so a lot of people are asking, so I know everybody's wondering what's going on out there, how do I deal with it? So uh, that is something that uh, is something you can deal with. They're hitting hard, but uh, as you can see, Cheryl's been keeping up on this. You see how everything's looking real pretty, you don't see uh, the flowers being all dried up, so it means it is possible to keep them looking good. Uh, she's been uh, spraying with the Multi-purpose. So she's been. This is a concentrate, makes 16, 16 gallons. So what you do with the, What's going on is that the thrip is a tiny insect. People call them no seams because most people can't see them. I'm really nearsighted. I can see them. I'm about the only one. <laughs> okay, but uh, don't ask me what's way over there. <laughs> But uh, most people cannot see them with the naked eye. We have a microscope down here. We can show you what they look like because uh, it's just a teeny, teeny little insect, but it can do a lot of cosmetic damage. Uh, what they do is they, they get into new growth. They love new leaves and new petals. So they'll get into the flower buds and uh, new leaves and they'll start sucking the juices out of the, out of the, uh, the, the plant. They'll rasp the skin of the leaf and kind of drink up the moisture coming out. And like I said, they're really tiny, but as the leaf is trying to grow, some parts of it are damaged and can't grow right, and so it starts twisting and contorting. And so you'll see these, these leaves that are all kind of curled and crumpled looking. Uh, the petals will look singed. So this is something what you want to do is you want to spray the new growth. Spray the whole thing, but especially the new growth. Aphids are the same way, they go for new growth. They come out 
every year at the same time. Uh, those are the ones that you can see, it's just covering over the rose, rosebuds. Notorious for getting on roses. They love the, the rosebuds. So those are the two things that you really want to uh, be ready for when dealing with roses, especially your hybrid teas, because they really go after those. So uh, best thing to do, don't wait until the damage is done. Spray the buds before they can even start opening and or as they're opening. Get that so that they can't do harm. Yes. What's it called? This is multi-purpose insect control. Pretty much kills all kinds of insects. Uh, this is actually, um, you've heard of uh, insecticides made of crushed chrysanthemums? This is basically uh, based on that. Um, it's something that's safe for edibles. You can spray this on your vegetables, your fruits. You can actually sp spray this on things that you're gonna eat. This is incredibly effective on insects, and yet safe for us. Kills blister beetles. Come August, you're gonna need this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> How often do you spray? Is How often do you spray? Time? In the case of uh, thrip and aphid, I would say do it once a week, just for right now. As soon as it heats up, it's warm now, but it's not really hot yet. Uh, although some of you in the back might be kind of disagreeing with me because you're sitting right in the sun, but it's not really that hot yet. Uh, so as soon as it heats up a little more, the thrip will go away on their own. They just they can't take the heat. They come out during the cool seasons. So they, they hit real hard in spring and then again in fall. So this is only a temporary thing. Um, but this is when you're, you're, some of your best roses you're going to be coming out is right now in spring. So you really want to be ready for them. You don't want to lose them to uh, so much, like I said, very severe cosmetic damage. Sometimes the roses can be damaged so bad that the buds won't even open. They'll just dry up and still be a bud. Seen it happen many times but again you can see we've got proof it works this is what Cheryl uh, sprayed last week and, and uh, she'll be doing it again at the end of the week yes so you said once a week once spray. a week okay. yeah so the thrip are going to keep coming you know, now, kill the ones you, that are there more will fly in while you're talking about insects uh -huh. we have a question online about whether there's a systemic that they can use okay so, the question online is, is there a systemic that you can use? A systemic is uh, an insecticide or product of whatever kind um, that you pour uh, into the roots or spray on the leaves and the plant actually absorbs it and it goes inside the, the plant system and makes the plant become toxic. Uh, so that is something that, yes, you absolutely can use. Yes, we do sell it. Please use responsibly. It is something that, um, uh, it, if you were to put it on something that bees are pollinating or hummingbirds are feeding on, it could be a, a hazard. So please use it responsibly. Yeah, know, know your yard. Know what is in there. Know what is feeding. Just, just uh, you know, be aware of that. But yes, it's extremely effective. You really can't get more effective than a systemic. You just can't. Now, we did have a big problem with it this year. <laughs> at least not the spring, but uh, sometimes you'll have some, uh, some fungus, some mildew crop up in spring and monsoon season when we're getting lots of rain. Uh, if that is the case, like I said, it's not an issue now, but it will become uh, monsoon, and so that's why I want to tell you, because the best way to prevent fungus and mildew, uh, to stop fungus and mildew is to prevent it rather than wait until it's already there and doing damage. It's actually way more effective to just hit it when you know it's going to happen. If you have stuff in your yard that seems to, to get mildew every year, you know exactly what's coming and when it's coming. Yeah, and roses, when, they, when it's really wet, roses can get, uh, get some mildew, some black spot on their leaves. And you know how our monsoons can be. It rains every single day, three o'clock, like clockwork. It just rains and rains and rains. Uh, so this right here is uh, this is triple action. This one's revitalized. We also have copper down there. We like to use uh, uh, natural stuff whenever possible. Revitalize. Uh, we started wearing <coughs> this this year. No, last year. So we've had this for about a year now. Uh, seems to be working really well. This is a, basically a probiotic for plants. You ever used a probiotic to cure an infection or 
uh, some kind of stomach issue or other issue that medical issue that you have. Same thing. They're starting to make probiotics for plants, and they're working pretty well. We're actually seeing really good results. This is a um, beneficial bacteria probiotic. <coughs> uh, spread on the leaves or drench it into the roots. Goes inside the system and boosts the immune system. Works naturally. Seems to be really effective. Uh, it's supposed to have. Uh, we're kind of watching certain trees right now to see how well it works. Um, we're expecting this uh, to have an effect on certain diseases that other fungicides won't work on. So in your guys' case, spray this come July. Yes? Uh, yes, yes, we have it in concentrate. Uh, someone was raising their hand back there. I think it was you. How does it compare to copper fungicide? So this one... The tree will actually absorb it, or the plant, the rose, whatever you're sprayed on, it will actually absorb it. It'll go inside and boost the immune system. The copper, when you spray it on the leaves, it doesn't get absorbed by the plant. It's just a mineral. It's literal copper, emulsified, and uh, prevents fungus from growing on top of the leaves. So it only works on things that are on the surface uh, of the leaf with a hat. This one? Yeah. Um, it's called Revitalize. It's a biofungicide. Revitalize. Thank yeah, that's the, the name that they're calling it. And it says right here, triggers plant immune response. So it literally works with the immune system. Yes. Can you spray it on tomato plant leaves? Can you spray it on tomato plant leaves? Absolutely. This is really safe. You can put it on your edibles. Yeah. On trees, too? On trees, yes. So again, this is something that is natural, organic. It will not harm you, it will not harm your pets. It's simply a beneficial bacteria that it's literally a probiotic for plants. That's what it is. How often? Uh, you know what, I can't remember. I'm gonna have to look it up uh, to see how, how often, but it's one of those things uh, because of the way it works, uh, it's more of a hit when you see the symptoms kind of thing. It doesn't wear off like most fungicides would. Most of them, as soon as it rains, it'll wash off. Um, that's why we used to sell a lot of fumes. It, it was a systemic fungicide. Uh, so it couldn't wash off in rain. That was a great thing about it. Um, but it wasn't something that was safe for edibles. You know, it, it was just a chemical. It wasn't, you know, really hazardous. But, you know, you couldn't put it on your tomato plant. Uh, this you can't because this is not a chemical, this is a, this is a bacteria. All right, and then um, one more thing I wanna talk about is uh, the fertilizer, because that's the other question we get a lot of. You know what, I wanna say one more thing before I get off the subject of how to kill things. <laughs> when you're spraying anything, and I mean anything, could be insecticide, fungicide, weed killer, anything. I really, really, really recommend this. This is called spreader sticker. Basically, this is a wetting agent. You, you ever notice when you spray a plant, the liquid just kind of rolls off, it doesn't really stay there? You spray it on the insect and it feeds up and rolls off their back, especially aphids. It, it especially does that with aphids because they have kind of a waxy body. That's what this is for. This will literally make it step and spread out over the leaf instead of beating up the rolling off. It's uh, very, very safe to use. Put it on edibles, anything, literally anything, it's safe. And it little goes a long way. You're, you'll use something like a half a teaspoon per gallon. So just a very little bit, but it makes sure that it adheres instead of rolling it off. What do you huh? What's it Spreader sticker. Yeah. Honestly, it? this is one of those products that I just love. It's amazing. It just it changes everything. It really does. Yeah. Do you add that to an, uh, to some of the other things, or do you spray that first? You can do it either way. The question was, do you add it to the insecticide or pesticide or whatever, or do you spray it first? You can actually do it either way. Sometimes with a hose and sprayer, it's kind of hard to mix up because of you're using a straight concentrate. So sometimes it's easier to spray it first and then immediately spray the other. 
but otherwise, I usually put it directly into the insecticide, weed killer, whatever we're using. Um, it'll tell you in the back how much to use. It'll be something like half a teaspoon for insecticides and a full teaspoon for weed killers or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it basically just says a teaspoon or so. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, yes? Well, not about insecticide, but what's the best way to deal with suckers? Suckers, so are we talking the aphids, the thrip, no, no, no. or the... Okay, all right. So the question um, that you were having was suckers. What do you do when you see suckers coming up out of the roots of a tree, a rose, or whatever? Cut them off. Mm -hmm. If you spray a weed killer on it, it'll travel down through that sucker into the root and hurt the parent plant. So don't spray a weed killer. Just cut it off. In the case of roses, if you see any suckers coming out from the ground, unless it's a shrub rose, that's okay, because that's how they, they grow. But if you see it coming from the roots of a grafted rose, just cut it off. Otherwise, what you'll get is this really ugly red rose called doggy, uh, Dr. Q. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, a lot of these roses, particularly the cane roses, are grafted. Let's see. This one right here is a firefighter. Uh, by the way, after you uh, finish this class, you need to come up here and smell the firefighter. <laughs> so, this is one of my favorites for fragrance. So, uh, here is the graft. Basically, this is Dr. Huey's rootstock. Okay, because it's a, it's a very vigorous, hardy uh, rose that can take our tough soils. That's what it is. And then they grafted Firefighter onto Dr. Huey's rootstock. So if a, a sucker were to come up below that graft, either out of the trunk or out of the roots, it wouldn't be Firefighter. It would be a, this wild rose that looks kind of funky. And what it'll do is it'll grow up all the way around the firefighter and you won't even be able to see the firefighter anymore. So go ahead and just cut those off and, uh, and remove them. I've heard that you have to break them off rather than cut them off. Break them off rather than cut them off? Yeah. Uh, if, if, if there's a, a segment that can break off easily, you could, but generally no, you'd have to cut them off. Yeah, it's not going to make any difference which one you do, really. Yes? Which ones are self-cleaning? Great question. You know what? Uh, the shrub roses and the ground cover roses, that's a part of their easy elegance, is the fact that if you don't get around to deadheading, they actually will look fine. Um, you can't do that with all roses. Normally, you'd have to take, let's take the, that firefighter again, or hopefully let's take this one. We'll talk about deadheading for a second. So this right here is a floribunda. Uh, normally, when you would cut this, and you can see that the floribunda grows these clusters of roses rather than a single stem rose. So when, when these uh, uh, stop blooming, you would you know, cut that. And actually, I wouldn't cut it here. I would actually come down a little further so that I don't have this long stick sticking out of the bush. I would cut it down so that it, it stays within the shape. Maintain the shape while you're deadheaded. So basically when the flowers are spent, uh, you'll have this kind of rose hip sitting there. Unless you plan on eating that, you don't really want to leave that there. You want to cut that off as soon as possible in order to keep it blooming and to keep it looking good. Otherwise you just have these dead hips looking there. They don't look so great. So to keep it looking pretty and to keep it uh, re-blooming re as soon as possible, you want to take those off. Now, if you really don't have a lot of time on your hands, so here's a, Karamba shrub rose. When these uh, petals fade and fall off, it'll leave a hip so small and so uh, less noticeable than the bigger roses that if you don't get around to you know, deadheading soon, it's not going to sit there and, and make your garden look hideous. And what's more is that because these bloom so much anyway, it's still going to keep blooming. So I'll, I'll tell you the trick that the growers all have to know in order to sell a rose. When one rose is finished, it's 45 days before the next one reblooms on a, on a regular cane rose. That's what you're looking at, 45 days. 
the, for the, the re replacement flower to come out. When you have a shrub that only puts out so many flowers, um, you don't want to be waiting that long. You want to get that off as soon as possible so that the, the replacement flower can come out. With these, it's blooming so much already that if you don't get to it as quick, it's no big deal. It's still gonna bloom. It's still gonna look fantastic. So that's another, uh, another reason to just love these, these uh, shrub roses because let's face it, I love gardening. I don't always have time for it. It's, sometimes my garden looks like the, the shoemaker's kids, you know? <laughs> and I need it to be easy. So you have to think about how much time do I really have for this? And so you always think, uh, what's going to really be best for my time frame? And you don't want to, we're all busy. We are just plain busy. So, you know, go for easy. So like I said, uh, you know, look for that easy elegance pot. You're going to see a whole bunch of them. There's just rows upon rows upon rows of, of these in the easy elegance pots. These are the shrub roses. These are the easy ones. You know what, sometimes I've even seen people just not even bother with clipping each little dead head off. They'll just take the hedges and go, yo, done. <laughs> Easy. You can do that with a shrub rose. You can't do that with a cane, but you can do that with a shrub rose. How about the climbers? The climbers are more similar to the cane rose. Uh, so you'll, you'll just head each individually. <coughs> Let's see. This is Blaze right here. This is Blaze, so uh, you would be deadheading each one individually and then um, also doing that extensive pruning on it, just like you would with the cane, try to minimize the canes. But then as it grows, you also gotta work it up the, the, the climbing trellis, because they're actually not great climbers on their own. Oh, thank you. So that is something that, to keep in mind with climbers, they're actually pretty easy. Just remember that from time to time go out and kind of work the stems through the trellis because they actually, uh, in, in the wild, they're, they're not going to go grabbing onto things and trying to climb. That's not their nature. They actually ramble on the ground if nobody's there to train them. So do put them, uh, kind of work them in. Like I said, it's not that, that time consuming, but it is one thing you want to be aware of. Sometimes I'll leave some main canes going through the trellis, but again, you gotta take out canes that are old because they're not gonna produce well. They'll just get really woody and ugly and not uh, produce flowers. Question. Yes. So you've got shrub, you have cane, and you have climbing, correct? Pretty much, yeah. Those three categories. Yeah. So basically, <coughs> there's, there's subcategories too, but so your main categories, you have your cane roses, those are your hybrid teas. Um, that can be further uh, divided into three, generally mostly three categories. You have your floribundas, those are the ones with the clusters of roses instead of one big rose. You have your, your typical hybrid tea that grows about five foot tall, really good for cutting uh, roses to put in, into a vase. And you have your ground floras, which looks exactly like a hybrid tea, only huge. Um, great one to go with if you want a tall rose but don't want to deal with the trellis. Those are great for that. Um, get real big flowers on them, they get real tall, they'll come up to the eaves of the house. Um, so those are your, your cane roses, your hybrid teas. Those are the ones that kind of tend to intimidate people a little bit. They're actually, don't let it intimidate you. It's really not, um, it's not going to die if you make the wrong snip or something. It, Stop, stop trying to be a perfectionist. It's going to be okay. You're not going to kill it. It's a, there's a learning curve. A lot of this is just going to be working with them and kind of getting used to what works and what doesn't. So don't be intimidated by them, but those are the ones that I find most people kind of are. So uh, those, are the, those are the ones that we're talking about canes most of the time. Then you've got your shrub roses. Uh, you have your basic shrub roses that are generally around uh, four foot, sometimes five, sometimes three, but somewhere around that four foot. And then that would also, um, the same rules apply to the ground cover or carpet roses. Shrubby but shorter is what that is. And then uh, you have your climbing roses, which you basically kind of treat like a hybrid tea, but 
kind of work it up a trellis as it grows. So that's what you're working with. Yes. What do you classify lady banks in? So what do I classify lady banks in? That is a climbing rose. Again, in nature, it would just be a ground cover. It would, it would ramble long, long, long stems all over the ground. Uh, but you can train it up a trellis. Uh, they get enormous. So if, if, if they're old enough. Mm. Uh, they're very fast growing. Climbing roses in general are fast growing roses, which is generally what you want in a climber in order to cover that trellis quickly. Uh, they, those are a, kind of an old fashioned wild rose. That's one with that little tiny flower, but lots and lots of them. It looks like a shower of either snow or yellow, yellow flowers. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes? Do they like lots of sun and water? Do they like lots of sun and water? Yes and no. They like lots of sun. They want reasonable amount of water, but please don't overdo it. You can overdo it. Uh, roses are not as delicate as they look. So let's say a sun, for example, uh, as much as they can get, actually. They can live on less, but if, they, if they're in shape too much, they will get a lot of fungus and mildew. You'll be constantly battling mildew. It's just a guarantee. Uh, the sun will keep them healthy. And give me just a sec. And then as for the water, generally most roses in this area want weekly watering. So, you know, give it, say, depending on how big your rose is, uh, somewhere b between six and ten gallons, and that's it. And do that once a week and you're fine. Uh, so this guy, I probably, even when full grown, maybe four gallons, because this is a carpet, he's not going to get big. Uh, hybrid tea, you know, again, they're only about, what, five foot? I'm five six, so five foot somewhere around in here. Now, I'll give him six gallons of water. We're good. The climbers and the ground of fours that can get real, real tall, you might have to, if they're full grown and they're really huge, you may have to give them, you know, say 10 or so. But only do it once a week. Maybe twice during that first summer just to get them established. That's it. Oh, uh, if you water too frequently, you're going to have trouble. You're going to invite all kinds of trouble. Once a week for the rest of his life. <clears throat> so the question is, should she put a rose in a place that tends to collect a lot of water during monsoon? It may be too much, so be aware of that. There may be, uh, you might want to put it higher up on the slope or maybe mound them so that they have better drainage. You had a question. Do the climbers only bloom once a year? Good question. Most of them keep blooming. There are some varieties like the Lady Banks and I think the Cecil Bruner, uh, some of those older roses uh, will only bloom once or maybe twice a year. So it just depends on which kind you get. But lots of them will keep blooming, especially the ones with the big flowers. The ones that only bloom once, they generally have a smaller flower. The Cecil, Cecil Bruner, it's only about that big, got a pink flower. Uh, and then the Lady Banks only blooms once, real tiny. So yeah, those are spring bloomers. Okay, since we're on the subject of blooming, something I wanted to, to mention is the fertilizing. Uh, this is uh, partly to do with the health, and partly to do with the, the, the blooming. Because a healthy rose is gonna bloom. So this is, you wanna fertilize. Um, we have, Horrible soil. Has anyone here tried to dig yet? <laughs> so you know how bad it is? Do you know there is absolutely no nutritional content in there? There's nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, so it's something that, I mean, there's no, no nitrogen. Uh, the, the, uh, the micronutrients, they're all tied up. There's just nothing to support anything. If you look at the native growers, like the scrub oak, uh, the pine trees, do you know how slow growing those are? Have you ever actually tried to watch one of those grow? <laughs> There's a reason for that. They have to live on nothing. It, it can take many, many years just to get this tall. If you look at some of those native growers and they look really skimpy and scraggly, they're living on nothing. So you try to put a rose in that or just about any plant really, and what are you going to end up with? You're going to have something that just sits there and looks like, 
I'm gonna die if you don't do something, <laughs> okay? So you, you definitely need to be fertilizing on a regular basis. Do not expect the soil to support anything you put in, put in there, okay? Especially since a lot of you, you don't even have native topsoil. You have something that's even worse. The contractor left you with something you, that shouldn't even be spoken of. It's so horrible. So um, that builder is awful. I used to be the, in the planting department, and I was someone that came out to your houses and jackhammered. So I, I've seen pretty much this whole area. I know what your soil looks like, trust me. It, it doesn't get any worse. <laughs> so you definitely need to be fertilizing. That one is something that really throws people for a loop when they move in from other states. They're used to the idea of you plant it and then nature takes care of it kind of thing. Won't work here. We have no nutritional content. You must fertilize on a regular basis. And if you do that, you're gonna you're gonna see a fantastic change in everything you plant, including your roses. Uh, this is something we we found that that fertilizers uh, that were made over on the east coast just weren't working here. I mean, seriously, they 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 were not either they were ineffective or in some cases even detrimental because our soil is so different, our climate, our water is so different. In many cases we have to do things the exact opposite of what people do back east or in California. So because of that, we finally just got around to making our own food. We've been selling this for how many years now? Long time. And this is something that is just going to change the game entirely. This is all I use at home. This is the, the Water's All Purpose 744. This works. So if you think about feeding yourself, you always want to have an, a good, nutritionally balanced meal. You want to have your protein and your carbohydrates all in the right balance. You want to have whole grains and not refined stuff, you want natural and rather than pre-processed, you want to have lots of vegetables. Think of a really good healthy meal. That's what this is for plants. This is what, I mean it's, it's actually got nutrients in here, not just macros but even the micronutrients that are needed for strength and immunity and for great color and flavor in vegetables <coughs> and fruits. It's actually in here. It's not just a, here's just enough to get by on, but not really to be great, healthy. Some, honestly, some fertilizers are like fast food. It's not real food. This is real food. This is, this is the way I, would, I really ought to be eating myself <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so this is a, a really great product. Now, if you want to boost the blooming, you can do that. Uh, every fertilizer and supplement has three numbers on it. I'm sure you've noticed them, and sometimes you're thinking, which one was which again? First one's nitrogen, second one is phosphorus, third one's potash or potassium. Nitrogen is for the green leafy growth, growing stems, growing leaves, and maintaining. Uh, the second one is the phosphorus, that is for blooming and rooting. When you have roses, you need to have that phosphorus. If you have the other two, you'll have uh, plants that look green and nice and bushy and have no blooms, none. So that's what the phosphorus is for. And then the last one, potassium, is for strength and immunity. The phosphorus is a little bit too as well. You can, so that will keep your, your roses blooming, that uh, four in the middle there, that's the phosphorus. That will keep them blooming. If you want to boost that number, you can. You can absolutely add a supplement that will boost that. Uh, your grandmother's always used bone meal. And a lot of times I do too. But it's something that uh, you, you put it in the fall. Uh, it's got to have several months to kick in. You've got to be regular about using it. Uh, so something that's a little faster working is the flower power. Yes? Is that a granule? Is this granular? Yes. Sprinkle it on the ground or mix it in with the soil. Yes. Absolutely. When you open this up, you'll see that it's natural looking. It's not, it doesn't look like pellets. It's natural ingredients that are mixed together. I mean, it looks like uh, all kinds of different seeds and dirt and grains of things. It, it's all mixed up. Yeah. 
one thing that has worked for me over the years, is I've been buying that for a long time, and I don't work for waters, um, is when I get a new plant or shrubs or bush or whatever, I put a little bit of the seven four in the ground, mix it up with some of the dirt, put the plant in, and then some mulch, regular dirt, a little bit more of that, more of it, and then I'll put some sprinkle around mm -hmm. that and then mulch on the top. Yeah. I do Fantastic. that, and I, I fertilize my regular plants, shrubs, trees, whatever, yeah. about three times a year. And yeah. it's kept almost all of them real healthy. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. Testimony from someone who doesn't work here. <laughs> yeah, and I don't. Yeah. And yeah, she doesn't. It never has. Uh, and you'll you'll get that from longtime customers. We've been around for what are forty going on fifty years. Uh, we li yeah, literally the owner grew up with you know some people's kids. Uh, her dad started this business, and uh, so now Lisa's running it with her husband Ken. You probably have all heard of Ken because he's the one. He's the extrovert. So he's the one that does all like the marketing and stuff. Uh, Lisa is is less likely to get in front of cameras and microphones, but she's the one that she's pretty much always here at the store. You can almost always find her here. Um, sometimes we have to kind of kick her out. Go take a break, Lisa, uh, because she's always here. So uh, you know, she she these two have just been gardening for almost all their lives, and Lisa's she literally has been doing it since she was born. She grew up in the garden center. So these, these are products that uh, Lisa and Ken made because this is what we needed. There wasn't a product that worked for us. We needed something. So they made this for here, for, for Northern Arizona. And it works. Uh, so yes, when you plant, you'll want to use the mulch to amend the soil. Because as you've noticed, it's pretty tough stuff. And you'll want to use this. Uh, and, and then I would also recommend, this is one more product uh, from uh, Ken and Lisa. This is a root stimulator. This stuff really does work. I get amazing customer feedback on this product as well. Um, I love customer feedback. It, I mean, you can, you can talk book knowledge all you want, but when, when you have so many people coming in and saying, this product works, then you really know you've hit the right stuff. So these are two products that have very loyal followings and always a growing following. So people who try this for the first time say, wow, that just knocks everything else out of the water. This stuff really does work. So this is something that uh, will help encourage that, that root growth when you first transplant. Or anything under stress, give them a shot of this. They'll feel a lot better. Ella, we have another question on sure. the live stream. Uh, yes. Carol would like to know whether you fertilize in, uh, roses in a pot or container the same way you do if you plant them in the soil? Great question. Carol wants to know, uh, do you fertilize in a pot the same way you do in the ground? Uh, and with, this, with these, yes, absolutely. Uh, I have a large container garden plus a lot of things in beds and shrubs all over the place that, that I take care of and this is all I use for all of it. I use this and sometimes I give it a boost of phosphorus and Oh my goodness, I, oh, here's what I'm gonna, gonna do. I want you, when you have, have a moment, go online and Google whatever your favorite flowering plant is. Google rose, um, if you've got other flowering plants in your home, Google that, and the pictures will come up of these shrubs and flowers that are just covered in flowers, okay? Covered, and you're thinking, does mine look like that? No. If, you, if you're saying, no, it doesn't look like that, then you need to boost that phosphorus count. Like this, this is crazy high, uh, 52. That's a phosphorus count on this one, 52. That's enormous. It, it, you can't actually get higher than that without it just turning into a gel that can't solubilize. Yes. Can you use both of those um, 744 and a flower pot? Can you use these together? Yeah. So basically think of this as the main meal, and this is more like the Red Bull. <laughs> you put this on your roses, they're going to think they have wings. <laughs> and the petals just might be big enough to, to look like them, too. 
So, uh, yeah, you, so try that sometime. I mean, whatever you've got flowering in, in your garden, try Googling it and seeing how does that compare? Can I make that better? And uh, you'll, you'll be in love with the results that you get. Yes? Okay, um, I'm confused as to how that works. You said that the blooms take 42 days? 45 days. 45 so let's say we're talking about, uh, you know, one of these, these uh, uh, climbers or one of these hybrid teeth, well, any of them, really. Yeah, uh, you, you cut off a rose, or if it stops blooming, it's going to be 45 day, days before another rose comes out Does to replace it. speed it up? Um, it's not going to speed it up, but it'll mean that you'll, when it does rebloom, it'll get more of them. It'll get bigger blooms. Yes. So, for example, uh, when a grower says, is thinking, okay, these roses are supposed to hit the market April 15th. I want them blooming and looking their best at that time so that they fly off the shelves. 45 days before that, they're going to cut off all of the roses. It doesn't matter whether they're blooming or buds or anything. They're going to cut them all off. And 45 days later, they're all going to be flowering and open and ready to sell. That's their, their trip. So if you've got a wedding coming up, do that 45 days before your wedding, go out there and cut off everything. Whether it's a, a full bloom or a bud or anything, cut them all off and they're all gonna rebloom in 45 days. So that's that's a little little grower's trip there. Yeah. How often do you fertilize? How often do you fertilize? Uh, with this one, four yeah. times a year. Yeah. And it can vary a little bit according to your soil type as well. But uh, for most of us, it's four times a year. I do it four times. Uh, this one, like I said, is more of a supplement. Uh, this is something that you can use up to every two weeks. This is to boost your, your blossoming, okay? Uh, this is water soluble, which means it goes to work right away. It doesn't have to break down the soil. It goes to work right away. Yes? Is that any different than superphosphate? It's a... Uh, Yes, it's faster acting. Is it any different than superphosphate? This one's faster. Bone meal is the slowest one. Superphosphate is a little faster. And then this one is, this is gonna make anything and everything bloom that you put it on right away. 